Hi everyone, it's Tim Spector of the Zoe Health Study. And I've had a very busy time uh, publishing my book this week, uh, Food for Life, uh, which is the combination of six years study. And uh, hopefully uh, I won't be doing that again in a hurry. But um, I wanted to tell you all about what's happening on, with COVID and the Big If study, but I'm taking a few days break. So I'm handing over to my fantastic colleague, Sarah Berry, who's going to tell you all about it. And we'll catch up again in a couple of weeks. Bye. Thanks for that introduction, Tim. And to those that don't know me, I'm Dr. Sarah Berry. I'm the chief scientist at Zoe. And as Tim mentioned, he's currently having a uh, nice holiday after publishing his book, Food for Life. So I'm going to be giving you the latest updates from the Zoe Health Study. I'll be talking to you about the latest COVID rates, which continue to decline, although more slowly, as well as rates of colds, which are currently twice as common as COVID. And I'm also going to be sharing some of the latest insights from the big if intermittent fasting study that we launched in the app last week, which I'm super excited about, including how many people are taking part, how many snacks you're eating and what time windows you typically eat in. OK, so let's dive first into the data on intermittent fasting. So the big if study now has more than 90,000 people signed up to join. This is the largest ever clinical study. It's amazing. And I'm so excited as a nutritional scientist that spent more than 20 years working on this kind of research. It's just phenomenal. Just as a reminder, the intermittent fasting study hopes to find out more about changing not what you eat, but how you eat within a 10 hour window in this case, how it can affect your mood, your hunger, your energy levels and so much more. There's still loads of time to get involved, but we want even more of you to take part so that we can get even better results. So firstly, let's look at who's taking part. So far, we've, so far we've seen that 78% females are taking part and only 28% males are joining up. So come on, men, we want more of you to take part in this research. It's really important in research to get a good balance of males and females. We also see that the average age of those joining the study is 60 years old, and we're delighted that we have a really wide range of ages using the app. So please do get involved, particularly if you're on the younger side as well. It's so easy to do. It's so easy to take part and only takes a couple of minutes a day to report your eating times. Now, interestingly, most of you are in the southern regions that are joining up in the UK. And so, again, we want to have a more representative uh, uh, populations so we want more of you northerners to get involved too so let's look at some of the results and as part of the sign up process of the study we asked you to complete a short questionnaire on your lifestyle to give us good baseline of your eating habits and your gut health and what you can see here from this graph is that most people consumed two snacks per day and we found that those that were consuming snacks often, so more than two snacks a day, we're consuming more on days off compared to working days. And then we found that the reverse is true for those that were consuming less frequent snacks. And we found interestingly that the average number of snacks that you're all consuming is two and a half a day. And this is in line with what we already know from other research from our predict studies, but also work I've done previously over the years. And it's great to see that these initial results, even a week in, are reflecting what other published research is showing, but on a huge scale. And I'm particularly interested in snack snacking as a dietary habit. We know that snacking accounts for 20% of our energy intake on average in the UK. So for someone consuming about 2,000 calories, this is about 400 calories a day come from snacks. So it's a really simple dietary strategy that we can modify to improve our health. OK, so let's move on for, from snacking and look at something else really interesting, which is the number of times you're eating each day. And this is what we call eating events. So this includes main meals as well as the snacks that we just talked about. And what we found was that those that have a wider eating window, so those that tend to eat for more than 12 hours, for example, a day, tend to eat more times, so tend to have more eating events. Yet those with a smaller eating window so consuming meals within a 10 hour period tend to have fewer 
eating events. We also looked at eating patterns that people typically followed and we found that a quarter of people were already actually practicing intermittent fasting, which I think is really fascinating. If this is you, don't worry, you can still take part. And it's actually really important you still do take part. And we suggest that you use this as an opportunity to see how adjusting your eating time window for two weeks affects how you feel. So let's say, for example, if you normally eat within eight hours, you could see how eating within 10 hours affects you or seven hours affects you. Or if you don't want to change your eating window, you can still participate in the study and log whilst fasting intermittently as usual, because this data is still going to be really helpful for our research and you'll still be able to receive your own personalized insights at the end of the study. So what did we see with the eating windows? Well, we found that the mean eating window for those taking part in the study is around 11 and a half hours. So this is only one week into the study and we're always already learning a lot about people's eating windows. Um, as this is baseline, hopefully it shouldn't be too challenging to therefore bring this down to 10 hours. So it's only reducing it for the majority of you for about one and a half hours. Now, if we look at this graph here and look at the meal consumption times, we can see from this graph that the most common time on a working day for the last meal is about 8.30. So 47% of people ate at or after 8 in the evening, which is really surprising. On days off, the most common time for the last energy intake, the last eating event, was even later at nine o'clock. And I find this really interesting as we want to see if this can stand up to the evidence that already exists, which shows that eating later in the day is unfavorable for your health and that we should be eating more in line with our body clock, so trying to eat earlier in the day. We also saw that the most common time for eating in the morning is 8 a.m. And what we know is that irrespective of calories consumed, previous studies have shown that your eating window does make a difference to a whole manner of things in your body. So we know that people that practice time-restricted eating have improvements in all sorts of things from their mood, their hunger, their energy, their weight, their blood pressure, their glucose control and inflammation. And I'm going to be really interested to see the results once more of you have completed the study and how measuring these in the noisy way in which we live our life plays out rather than the way that other studies have been typically run in this very tightly controlled clinical star settings. So these initial results are really exciting. We're going to bring bringing you more updates on the big IF study in the coming weeks. And we're going to be publishing our, our results as well to enable everyone as well as the scientific community to see this incredible community science project that you're all taking part in. We do still need more of you to get involved, so please do keep sharing the app and study with friends and telling people about this um, as you did when the app only looked at COVID. Thank you. Okay, so let's look at COVID now. And we know that new COVID cases are continuing to decline, which is great news, but the rate at which that's happening has slowed down a little bit. The rates now are about 20% lower than two weeks ago. So there's an estimated about 170,000 new cases a day and about one in 25 people currently have COVID with the R number back down to one again. And if we look at the graph on the age ranges of those getting COVID, it's really clear why the rates appear to be in a slower decline than in previous weeks. And the blue line shows that children aged 0 to 17, we can see clearly an increase in cases in this group over the last two weeks. And we actually expect this to be mirrored, therefore, in their parents' age group, so 35 to 54, as this is usually the pattern that we see. Now, this might come down again due to children not being at school, um, like mine weren't last week over half term. So we're going to keep a close eye on the figures and as always, we'll let you know about any changes. What about new variants? Well, we've had information that there are new variants um, circulating in England. They appear to be derivatives of Omicron. But so far, the variants uh, that the UK HSA are investigating haven't been designated as variants of concern. But as a reminder, it's not unusual to see variants emerging, though, and vaccination remains our best defence against future COVID waves. It's still as important as ever, therefore, that you get vaccine doses as soon as you're eligible and invited. If we look at symptoms, we're continuing to monitor all of these symptoms in our Zoe Health Study app. And thanks to your reports, we can bring you the latest COVID symptoms. Um, so our top symptoms at the moment are sore throat, blocked nose, headache, um, and uh, runny nose. And we've not actually seen any changes as a result of any of these new variants. And that's mainly because they're still really rare at the moment.
However, we will continue to look at these and we'll note any shifts or changes for you to look out for. Currently, the symptoms actually remain very similar to a cold or any other respiratory illness. But we have found that the main indicator of COVID tends to be a scratchy sore throat, which is not as common in colds. So what about colds? Well, our colds and non-COVID respiratory illness data shown here indicate that although colds are now more than twice as likely as COVID, both are going down, which is great news. It's unclear at this stage whether it will continue to decline and if so, how long for. We'll continue to monitor all of your symptoms and reports in the app. And if it's a parent like me of school age children, um, I think you'll be relieved to see that these uh, are coming down. So I think it's been a really exciting week. There's loads of amazing data so far from the big IF study, but we want even more of you to get involved. So share the app, like I said, with your friends and your family. Great news that COVID cases are still declining, but not as fast as before. And just a note that we're seeing more cases in children. With new variants constantly emerging, it's nothing to worry about at the moment, but take care to continue to practice good hygiene wherever possible, especially if you're out and about in public and also crowded spaces. Considering wearing a mask on the tube, for example, carrying a small bottle of antibacterial with you uh, to clean your hands, especially if sinks aren't available. There's also plenty of time to join our Big If study and you'll get even more out of it if you join the Big Diet study first. So do make sure to check your emails for the invite to do that as well. Please remember to like and subscribe to our channel. Please share the app with friends and family and please continue to support the science and keep blogging. Thank you.